couple of announcements before we start. Just some quick announcements. Uh, our condolences, of course, uh, Darlene, she comes to our fellowship here. She drives out from uh, Cala Mesa area. Uh, her mother passed away and um, last, when, when was it, Roy? A couple of weeks ago? June 20th. June 20th, yeah. It was a little bit ago. Uh, Brother Roy and Art did the funeral services. Um, our condolences, of course, to her family. And she, she's a believer. So her mom is very much alive in Jesus. And it's great to, uh, it's great when you can say that and wholeheartedly agree with the scriptures to be absent from the bodies to be present with Jesus. Uh, condolences as well to the Reyes family. Um, Alex's uh, mother passed away this week and uh, on Friday. And so um, our condolences to them. Um, Diane used to work for the church. So we had a long relationship with Diane. She used to work with Carol. Had a wonderful time with her. We've known her for quite a long time. And um, I was able to go see her and pray with her. Um, and then Friday she went to be with the Lord. And uh, our brother Danny Isom, who um, uh, has uh, preached from this pulpit, he's a good friend of the ministry and fellowship, good friends with Rowan Kara for a long time, good friend of the ministry, myself for quite a long time, um, battling a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of things happened to him this past year, um, from heart complications to, di he has diabetes. And um, after the surgery, he wasn't doing so well, so uh, he went to be with the Lord on uh, Technically, Roy, was it Friday, but they announced it Saturday, right? Not, not that it's that important. When he passed? Yeah, when he passed away, technically. Uh, yeah. yeah, not trying to mince dates or anything like that, but just to kind of give you an idea. We, this whole week, it's been hospitals, calls, funerals, and uh, so Roy's tired. Uh, Anthony's tired, and uh, we're emotionally spent. Just uh, when one rejoices, we rejoice. When one cries, we cry. We sorrow with them. But we sorrow not like those who have no hope. And I'm glad to say all three uh, are with the Lord today. All three are alive. And um, I'm not trying to be too funny or anything like that. I'm just trying to be uh, respectful. But they're doing better than us. They're doing better than us. Um, we're the ones with the sorrow. We're the ones with that miss the person. We're the ones that can't pick up the phone and, and, and call them or talk to them or relate to them on this earth. But in terms of relating to them, as we pray to Jesus, they are in his presence. So they know Jesus better than us today. Uh, they can talk to Jesus. We can talk to Jesus. There's always a person that you can talk to that knows us both, right? It's almost like if you're out of town and you can't get a hold of your wife, but you know you called your good friend. And, hey, tell my wife I love her. Tell my wife, you know, we'll see her soon. Um, you can't get a hold of her, but you can talk to somebody that knows, knows her and could, can talk to her. Well, it's the same thing like this. We can talk to Jesus, and they can talk to Jesus. And so together we have one link. Um, and so there's never a broken link. There's always a continuous relationship. And at the resurrection, it will all be completely uh, restored in a better way, without sin and without the flesh. So our condolences to all the families, Isom families, Reyes family, Darlene's family. And we pray that the Lord will have comfort on them and the Lord will give them comfort and the spirit will give them comfort. And um, pray for those who have been ill. I think Chris is ill today. So we got to pray for Chris too. Uh, hopefully he does, he does well. So let's pray together. Lord, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. Oh, Lord, oh, the day to see you face to face. Lord, our brothers and sisters are seeing that now. Apart from the resurrected body, they're enjoying eternity. Lord, there's glory and there's joy. But Lord, for us, it is sorrow and it is, it is sadness. Uh, Lord, but there is hope and there is comfort, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the comfort of the Son of God, who um, can comfort us, Lord, like no other, who a smoking flask, he will not quench, a Bruce Reed, he will not break. That is true. He came to heal the brokenhearted comfort those who are broken and so lord we pray for comfort to those families and we ask for grace upon our family here a fellowship lord that although there is uh lord sadness there's also joy and that's the life of a christian as always there's sadness for missing the person but joy because of your great promises and we ask you this this morning to lead us into your word and to teach us more about you and about jesus and about the comfort that you bring to us but also lord the relationship with others Lord, 
We can learn so much from Paul and the Corinthians. We ask you to help us to do that and uh, draw us near, closer to you. Open our eyes so that we may see wonderful things in your word, in your law. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, our brother Patrick is here. And uh, brother Patrick is here. And uh, he was here Wednesday. And he was here, yes, he was there yesterday at our Bible study in Orange County. And uh, he uh, works and uh, out of this country with uh, a great group of people that he's trying to minister for the Lord. And um, I'm being cautious because we're recording and transmitting. Uh, but our brother will be, after I'm done teaching, he'll come up and show you some really cool slides. I think you have a slide, uh, Patrick. Am I? Okay. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. And how he ministers to people that are very persecuted, very maligned in our world. And uh, God uses them in a unique way. Uh, because he works with them. He actually, not just work in ministry, as we normally say, but literally works with them, alongside with them, teaching them skills, teaching them things that they can learn, but also ministering to them through the gospel. So um, I, I, I know we started a little late today, so um, bear with us today. If you have to leave, you have to leave when I'm done, and I promise that I will do as best as I can to get through the text not going through the whole chapter. That doesn't mean much, if you know what I'm saying, but it will get through it. We will get through it. I promise you that. Um, how fast? We'll let the Lord decide that. But uh, stay with us and um, learn what he's doing. Learn the encouragement yesterday that I got from Patrick was really cool. And on Wednesday, too, was, um, you know, we don't need to be seminary graduates or pastors or some kind of leader and some kind of ministry to actually go and minister to people and even if it's overseas you just need to be willing and whatever skill God has given you he will use it in a unique way so don't ever think well I'm not this I'm not that I didn't go this I didn't get trained for that it's always good to be trained it's always good to know more uh, but it's not a qualification in terms of ministering and working with people to have this you know degrees to the you know, the, you know, have a Ph.D. or an H2, H2SO4. You don't need to have any of those to actually minister to God's people. So uh, let's, let's get together and, uh, with Brother Patrick after service, and he'll teach us a thing or two about what it's like to minister to people who are maligned and are persecuted. Second Corinthians, let's go there now. Second Corinthians chapter 1, and this time we will not finish. We, well, we will finish, uh, but the first Corinthians chapter 1 bleeds into... 2 Corinthians chapter 1, bleeds into chapter 2. We're not going to get to chapter 2 today, but the context continues because Paul is ministering to this church. Got to get my stool. Where'd my stool go? There it is. And my water, because otherwise I'll knock it down. There we go. Paul is ministering to the Corinthians in this large city, very wealthy city, very wicked city. We learned that last week. It's in the province of Achaia. Province of Achaia. Uh, just near Athens, just south of Macedonia. Uh, all those things will make sense once we see what Paul is talking about, because it can get kind of confusing if we don't know the geography somewhat. But he's ministering to this church, and this church had many issues. Drunkenness, immorality, behavior, divisiveness uh, from other believers. And now the newest confusion, confusion about the resurrection. We, we studied that last letter. And Paul is now addressing them on something that has come up. They have issues with Paul. They have issues with Paul now. Now, I told you last week that the issues came because they didn't like Paul anymore. They like other preachers, and then others have come in and had muddied the waters and had broken the relationship between Paul and the Corinthians. I brought a little chart here. Maybe this helped a little bit, because last time I talked about the four letters to the Corinthians. And I don't anybody want to get confused uh, because part of teaching is making sure people understand it, right? It's just not to tell you how much we know, but the, the important thing is to understand it. Paul wrote four letters to the Corinthians. Two of them we have. They're called First and Second Corinthians. So if you know this already, tune out for five minutes. If you don't know, don't worry about it. it it's, uh, it, it won't be hard. He visited them three times. He visited them three times and he wrote four letters. In between his first and second visit, he wrote two letters. In between his second and third visit, he wrote the other two letters. Does that make sense? So in between his visits, first and second, he wrote a couple letters. 
In between his second and third, he wrote a couple of letters. So we total of four. So what we call 1 Corinthians in your Bible is actually the second letter. We'll call it letter B. Call it letter B. That's what we call 1 Corinthians. And he wrote it because there was trouble. There was trouble, as you can tell from the first letter that we have in our Bible. There was trouble of all kinds of issues. Sexual immorality. There was um, semi-incest by a man taking his father's wife. There was uh, issues of drunkenness and divisiveness in the, in, the, in, in the Lord's table and the confusion about the resurrection. All kinds of problems. And what led to Paul to write that letter? But we're told that he had written a previous letter. That would be letter A, right? Letter A and letter B. Then he visited them. Then the second visit came. And that what is called, and we'll find out next week, it's called the painful visit. What was a painful visit? Because Paul came to exhort them and rebuke them and making sure that they were not to go on with their sins. Now, the reality of why they were so in such bad shape, because they had hardness of hearts and they loved their sin, which is usually the case. A hardness of heart and a love for sin will cause you to be antagonistic toward others, right? If you love your sin and other people tell you you have a sin issue, you don't like that. And if you harden it more, you will become against them, right? Because they're trying to tell you that you're wrong, right? This is not just men only, men and women only. You know, it's just, it's a problem of humanity. And so the second letter came, that's the letter B. And uh, then a second visit came. Then came the severe letter, which is, we don't have that letter. It's the third letter that he wrote, and it's called the severe letter. He talks about it in this this second Corinthians that we have in our Bibles. He wrote this severe letter and uh, he thinks to be straightened out. And eventually he visit them again. And this is what we called, um, well, he wrote the second Corinthians in your Bibles called letter D, right? It would be the fourth one. He wrote that and he's encouraging them and he's thanking them for their, they got some of these issues straightened out. But there are some other issues that this letter speaks about, and that is the rejection of Paul, right? This is letters about the rejection of Paul. He's going to commend them, saying, hey, you did some good things. You got the issue of the, the sexual immorality straight now. Now we've got to talk about other issues. And eventually, the relationship got better. Eventually, Paul visits them a third time before he, uh, he leaves toward Rome, and he is actually um, um, encouraged and brought forth in a relationship back with the Corinthians that was much better. All that to say, Paul loved them, but they didn't love him back that much. Then the relationship got better. And so Paul is going to visit the Corinthians. He wants to visit them. And this was the, the source of the problem. The fact that he had told them he was going to visit them. And somehow, some way, uh, because of issues, and you'll see that in a moment, the false apostles were stirring up trouble and they're saying, Paul hasn't been here in a while. He's not a man you should follow. He's not trustworthy enough. And therefore, you shouldn't follow his words or follow his letters or follow his example. He is a troublemaker. And the false apostles here maligned the church against Paul. And they rejected him. And they were very harsh against Paul. All the critics against Paul. And, um, and they were saying that he behaves badly toward them. These were the ringleaders. These were the false apostles. In fact, uh, we'll get from the letter that they even came to Paul's face and tried to tell him that he was wrong. Now imagine this is the man who had preached the gospel to the Corinthians. We read that in Acts. He had led them to the Lord. Most of the people reading this letter were led by the ministry of Paul to the Lord. And now they turn against him. Has that ever happened to you? People that you loved and cared for and taught and ministered to them, all of a sudden they become enemies. And it's really not even an issue necessarily that came out of your sinful behavior. Others came and added to the fuel, to added fuel to the fire and made the relationship terrible. Terrible breaking relationships. And Paul needed to get back with them, right? Paul could have said, you know what, forget you guys. You guys treat me like that, right? That's a normal response sometimes. Fine, if you don't like me, I'm out. Paul loved them and cared for them. And you'll see that in his letter. This letter, 2 Corinthians, is probably one of the most personal letters you'll ever read. I almost blush sometimes because you're reading somebody else's letter. You know, you read somebody else's mail, it's illegal, right? But it's, it's, you read somebody else's letter and you're like, 
wow, this person really cares for them. And you sort of blush like, am I supposed to be reading this? And that's kind of like how we feel because Paul is so personal. Look, this happened to me. I'm in trouble. I had issues. And he's really opening his heart to them. And he's very sincere about that. So the relationship needs to be restored. And this is Paul's letter. He wants to restore, be restored back to them. So how can Christians be restored? Is that something that Jesus taught, right? Is something that Jesus was always making sure that if a relationship with Christians, or it could be your wife, it could be someone, but relationship with, with Christians need to be restored. Don't leave it up to chance. Do your best that you can to live at peace with them, if possible, to win them back. And so Paul is writing, not to just an individual, a whole church had come against him. And he loved them and cared for them. They were his children in the faith. And he wanted them to be back with the Lord. Because ultimately he knew this hardness of hearts, these false apostles, what was eventually will do to them, they'll go back to the beginning of where they were. In fact, even worse, if they keep hardening their hearts and listening to these false apostles. And you'll see at the end of the letter, Paul minces no words. He calls these false apostles not just, well, they're just misunderstood. He doesn't call them that. Oh, they just need to be, you know, put up with and you just need to kind of like go along with them you now he calls them ministers of Satan ministers of Satan false apostles angels of light that come deceiving God's people that's pretty straightforward isn't it that guy don't listen to him he is an agent of Satan you imagine somebody's telling that about a pastor or a leader and you go that sounds harsh well when it's true you better tell them when it's right and all the evidence is that you better say it. Otherwise, you might be leading that person that's listening to that false guy in the wrong direction. And his condition will be worse, Peter says at the end. But let's read the first few verses of, oh, sorry, not the first few verses, verse 12. We read the first few verses last week. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and specially toward you. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you'll understand until the end, just as you also partially did understand this, that we are your reason to be proud, as you, are, uh, as you also are ours. In the day of our Lord Jesus, in this confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. So what is the issue here? The first point that Paul is going to address is his sincerity. You know, when you're trying to bring two Christians together, this is the most important part. Now, they're all important, but we have to start with some, one of them. And this is really, really important. Sincerity. Paul is saying, I'm being sincere to you. I'm not the kind of person that the false apostles are saying, that he's been lying to them, that he doesn't keep his word, that he says he will visit, and then he doesn't come, right? Because that's what they were saying about Paul. Paul was duplicity. You know what duplicity is? It's the opposite of simplicity. Simplicity is you have one mind to do what you said you will do. Duplicity is you're divided. You, you say yes, but you mean no. Or you mean no, but you're actually going to do it anyway. And that person is kind of hard to figure out, right? Because it's like, well, what does he mean? Whenever he says something, he does the opposite. And they thought that Paul was being like that, right? That he was being duplicity toward them, duplicitous. He was not meaning what he said, that he said he was going to come, and he didn't come. What was the problem? Well, he ministered to the area of Asia Minor. Right? This whole area called Asia Minor uh, will be called Turkey today. And uh, Paul had written some letters to churches. And he had written the Corinthians a letter. We know that before. He had written two letters before that. Three letters before this, actually, second letter came forward. And, um, and they were saying to the false apostles were saying about Paul, that Paul doesn't really mean that he's coming. Paul is a liar. Paul is a... A false apostle. They would actually call them a false apostle. That you have to read between the lines when Paul writes something. And Paul was going to come and visit them. He had said that. In fact, look what it says in verse uh, 15. This is the confidence. Verse 16. That is, to pass your way into Macedonia. And again, for Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. 
Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? So they accused them that, look, he said he was coming, but he didn't come, right? He said he was going to come, but there were some problems. One of the problems he ran into, we know the story, probably because I've said it enough times here, the problems in Ephesus. What kind of problems did he have in Ephesus? Anybody know what kind of problems he had in Ephesus? Well, you can read that chapter, but if you haven't read it yet, or if you haven't read it, read it. But if you know, what kind of problems did he have? Anybody know? <laughs> yeah. And Ephesus, he had led people to the Lord, and it was so amazing, the work there, that uh, people that were practicing witchcraft and sorcery were burning their books of sorcery and witchcraft and coming to Christ, and they were abandoning the worship of Diana, queen of the Ephesians, and that infuriated the city. People were not making money off the idols that they were selling, and of course that led to a terrible, terrible uh, riot. It was a riot in Ephesus, and a riot wasn't a fun thing. They nearly killed him, as Frank said. But that started the trouble in Asia, which Paul speaks about what kind of trouble he had in Asia, that they were even desperate for their own lives. Think about a situation where, as Paul was going out and witnessing and sharing and teaching, people were there, put a hit on him. They, 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 had, a, they, they had a bounty on him. Uh, you could read it in the book of Acts, too. In the book of Acts, it says that there were even men that, were, that swore that they would not eat or drink anything until they killed Paul. That's the kind of life that Paul lived, trusting in God for his comfort and his protection. Uh, so his plan was to eventually uh, that he was going to change the course of his ministry. And he had told them that he was going to go not just to Corinth, not just to the Greek world, not just to Asia Minor anymore, this area here. He wanted to go further than this. All right? Paul had reached this area, but he wanted to go further. He didn't tell them where he was going to go. He actually told the Romans where he wanted to go. Anybody know where that, where that place is, where he wanted to go? He had to, Spain, that's right. He wanted to go as far as west as you can go. By the way, in that ancient world, Spain was as far as you can go. That was the edge of the earth. You would say Spain, you go, man, that's like us saying uh, Antarctica, right? Going down to Antarctica. Anybody been to the Arctic? Anybody here? No? That, that's, you know, that's, okay. Amen. Look at that. You got to tell us a thing or two about a thing or two, right? Uh, was it fun? No. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Joe's saying no. Uh, it's kind of like that. Well, what's out there? I don't know. The, yeah, it's, it's a lot of snow and ice. And, you know, and, 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 and what they said about Spain was kind of the same thing. Like, what's out there? I don't know. Uh, I mean, they, they knew about the British Isles because the, the Romans had conquered that area, Britannia, just north of that. Uh, so people went there. But Spain, ooh, yeah, that's, that's out there. But Paul's desire was to minister and to go to the ends of the earth and to go where no man had gone before, really, is to go and minister the gospel in places where nobody had gone. There was no ministry there. But Paul had gone there. But problem arose in Corinth. There was a problem arose, and he stopped by. But that visit didn't help. Actually, they continue, in the hardness of hearts, they continue in that sin. Now, his original plan was to leave Turkey, leave Greece, get back to Judea, and then head over to Spain. That was his original plan. But the problem in Corinth led him back to Corinth, and he had a minister there, and then he was going to go up to Macedonia, and then come back to Corinth, and then head over back to Spain, I mean, uh, back to Judea, so he can literally start the ministry in Spain after that. So he had a change of plan. Well, that change of plan didn't work out. He hadn't come back to, uh, Corinth, uh, to the Corinthians yet. He had gone to Macedonia, he had visited them. It didn't work. Problems in Ephesus, problems in Asia Minor. In fact, it was so bad, in the first part of the chapter, he says, we were even desperate for our own lives. Now, he won't tell us all the issues yet, and he won't tell them until chapter 2, so wait for next week, the details of what actually happened, right? Because he explains to them, you think I left you, but you don't even know what happened. You think I didn't show up because I didn't care for you or I was a liar. You don't know what Satan has actually hindered us. You don't know what Satan did against us, right? It's easy, to, this is again, relationship with Christians, right? It's easy to criticize other Christians in a fellowship because maybe they didn't keep their word. Hey, they said they were going to show up to my house and they didn't come. Well, what happened? I don't know, but he's a liar. She's a cheat. They won't come. They don't like me, see? Well, did you ask him what actually happened? Because they might have a really good reason why it didn't happen. 
No, they just don't like me. Right? We jump to conclusions, and if you got other people fomenting you, right? Oh, this guy's like that. Oh, man, he did this to me, too. And it begins to create this, this really bad division among Christians. And Paul is saying, I will tell you a little bit about it next time. But in the meantime, I want you to know that we are sincere. Look at the verse 12. I am confident, he says. Uh, we, are, uh, have a, we have a proud confidence. This proud confidence, right, is very important. He was sincere. He was confident, right? Uh, he's talking about his conscience. Literally means, I have interrogated my conscience. Right? You know what an interrogation of your conscience is? You know, let's say you do something against someone. Uh, I'm sorry, if something happens and that person's mad at you and they say, you did this to me. You know, what's the automatic response? Well, you did this to me too, right? No, nobody does that. Pray for me, right? Um, well, that's a normal response, right? Somebody accuses you of something, well, you accuse them back of what they did to you. Well, it has nothing to do with this conversation that was five years ago, right, ladies, right? Uh, yes, yeah, but what does it have to do with this? Absolutely nothing. We just have something to fight about, right? Um, well, this happened to Paul. He, w- he had done something. He didn't go back. And automatically they accused him. You're not a sincere person. You're a liar. You're a duplicitous liar. You don't keep your word. Now imagine talking to Paul the Apostle like that, right? A church that was led to the Lord by his ministry, his presence there, the work of the Spirit. You owe him your, you know, basically the ministry there. You're saved because of his ministry. Now you're angry at him. Paul is saying, I have thought about what I did. And my conscience bears witness. I have interrogated. I looked in my heart. I looked in my conscience is really what what he's saying. And in light of this, look what it says. Not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, in holiness and godly sincerity, we conducted ourselves right in the world and especially toward you. I didn't do anything wrong to you. I've looked at my conscience. I sincerely thought through what I what I did. And I realized there's nothing in my conscience, you know, trouble conscience is you know you're guilty. Paul says, I interrogated my conscience. I didn't do this to you. Now, he's not trying to defend himself. He's trying to bring forth the issue of like he looked upon this situation very strict in his conscience. And it didn't, his conscience didn't bear witness that he was wrong. He says, we write nothing to you else to you that you, that you, what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end. Look at the end of verse 14. In the day of our Lord Jesus. He's saying, look, one day I have to answer to the Lord. I know one day I'm going to stand before Christ. That's what he brings the, the coming of Jesus. It's a very important subject, right? Because when it all is done and all it's over and all that you've done will be weighed out, you know, for what you did for the Lord and what your motives and behavior was, uh, it'll be weighed out before Jesus. Uh, I want to be clear in my conscience, Paul is saying. And I'm clear. I have a clear conscience before Christ. On that day... I will not give it account for what I did on this situation, right? That's a clean conscience. You have a clean conscience like that? It's so good to have a clean conscience, right? Is if the conscience is bothering you, you know, do something about it. Repent, get the situation straightened out. But Paul is saying, my conscience is clear. My mind, I have come to glorify God. That's all I want to do is glorify God. And in my behavior toward you, Corinthians, I have glorified God. Uh, I don't have two minds. I'm not against you. I didn't lie to you. i rather just glorify God. Now, he's saying here in verse 12, not in fleshly wisdom, right? What's human wisdom? What's worldly wisdom? What's the worldly wisdom when you're arguing with someone? Somebody accuses you. What's the worldly wisdom to do? What's the worldly wisdom and the fleshly attitude? What is it? Defend yourself. Defend yourself sometimes without even... You know, literally trying to, you know, you really are even attacking the person now, right? Or you talk around things, right? You talk, you don't never get to the end of it, right? You never, you never are straightforward. You ever had somebody like that, right? You're never straightforward. You just circle the wagon, circle the wagons, and try to make sure that, well, at least I said it. I said what I said. But you didn't say sorry. Yeah, I didn't say sorry, but, you know, I told them about it. You know, and that, that was, you know, they know, they know. That's the worldly wisdom, right? Never get the situation straightened out. Never deal with it. Just circle the wagons, circle the wagons, and eventually the wagons will leave. <laughs> and you hope the, the wagons will leave, right? That's worldly wisdom. And if your behavior is like that, that's like the worldly wisdom. You know, you need to have a clear conscience. If something happened, deal with it, for good or for bad. 
Our effort is to have a clear conscience before God. Are you doing this to glorify God? Is the situation glorifying God? Well, he talks about sincerity, conscious and sincerity. Now, it's interesting here, the sincerity that Paul speaks about here is interesting. This is an old, old Greek word. We have it in English and we have it in Spanish. Sincera, right? And it literally means no wax. No wax. So if you know Spanish or Italian or something like that, you realize uh, the word seta means wax. Sin is without. No wax. Well, what does no wax mean? In the ancient times, you just, you, you, uh, if you have a garden, you, you, um, if you have a nice pretty garden, you want to make it prettier, you design it and you don't call a landscaper. Well, if you do call a landscaper, they will say, get some statues. Get this statue, get that statue, get Zeus, get Venus, you know, this is the Greek world. Get some statues, it'll make your landscape look beautiful. And that's the ancient world. And so you would go to the market and you get that statue. And, uh, ooh, this one's on sale. This one's on clearance. Well, it's on clearance for a reason. It's cracked. It's cracked and it's damaged. But it doesn't look damaged. No, the, uh, the dealer actually has put white wax on it. And it looks really nice. And so when you buy, you're like, wow, what a deal. It's on clearance. And you take it home and the sun shines and the, the, the rain comes and it weathers it, right? It weathers it. And you realize, ah, oh, look at all these cracks. You got Basically, you got scammed, right? Uh, there was wax on the statue, and it's, that's why it's on clearance. Nobody wants wax on the statue. So antique dealers in those ancient days will promote their statues being sincere, without wax. Come to our shop. We sell statues without wax, without fake. It's the real deal. There's no cracks. There's no bad things in it. You can get it, and there'll be no wax. That's the word sincere. It means straightforwardness. There's no wax in my conversation. When you talk to me, Paul says, I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you something. I'm not the dealer down the street. I guess you could say that about car dealerships, right? But you could say, hey, I'm not selling you anything bad. I'm bringing you sincere things. I'm not in it for me. I'm here to glorify God. And I love you. And I want to be straight with you. And I want to be sincere. There'll be no wax in my conversation. Isn't that wonderful? I wish Christians talked themselves, uh, talk to, the, to each other like that. Isn't that great? No? Why do you say that? Well, I think sometimes in a polite society, polite society can disguise themselves as sincerity. You know, politeness, right? Oh, yes, thank you. That's fine. And you never tell anybody what you really think. Well, if I told them what I really think, they won't like me. Well, they might appreciate the honesty. They might know that you are a person who has no wax, a sincere person. Don't you want to know where you stand? Right? Don't you want to, husbands, don't you want to know where you stand with your wife sometimes? No? Not a husband here will, will stand up and say anything. Oh, I'll stand up for you guys. Yes, of course we love to, right? We want to know. But this whole wax thing and insincerity and convert, it doesn't work. Why? We'll never know what the issue is. We'll never find out. It's so vague. It's so without any information. Well, God wants us to be sincere in our conversations, to tell the truth. Paul says in Ephesians, in Ephesians 5, let everybody tell the truth to his neighbor. Isn't that wonderful? Tell the truth to his neighbor. Now, we have to say it lovingly, of course. There's people that would take it the opposite end. Yeah, I told him he's fat. Oh, I told him she's ugly. Oh, I told him your house is a mess. Well, that might be true. But is it loving? Is it helpful? Is it needed at that moment in time? You've got to think about those things, right? But if there's a situation, if there's conflict between two Christians, what's the best thing? Be sincere. Yes, you hurt me. Yes, you said those things. And when you said it, that meant this to me. Well, you might find out that it was probably a misunderstanding. And Paul is trying to say, look, you think I, I left you. I didn't. I'm not like this. And I'm not a hypocrite, Right? I'm not saying one thing and mean another. I have no, me, no hidden messages in my letters. Because that's what they were trying to say about his letters. Uh, that he was meaning something different. Yeah, he says he's coming, but he really doesn't come. Right? He says he'll be here, but he really doesn't come. He's really not going to be here. Now, this happened to Paul the Apostle. Now, look at the word confidence there in this boasting. Boast, proud confidence in verse 12. Right? Look at verse 14. Uh, for also partial, uh, just as you also 
partially did understand us that we are your reason to be proud as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. This whole thing about pride and, and, and confidence, right? Boasting. Is boasting bad? Well, we're told the scriptures, yes, it is bad, but no, it is not bad. What does this mean? You'll find that in this letter, you'll find this word 25 times. Is that a bad thing? 25 times, boasting, boasting, boasting. Why does that mean? Is there such a thing as Christian boasting? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, what's worldly boasting? Anybody know? What's the world boast about the most? I'm the best. That's right. Usually about yourself, right? <laughs> Usually about your, or the things that you have done. Look what I have done. Look what I've done. Look what I did. Uh, their power, right? And this is what the false apostles and Corinthians were doing. Look at us. Look at us. We can speak better than Paul. I said, this, is what, this is what they said. They said, Paul can't talk. Now, early church history tells us that Paul could have had a uh, speech impediment. Could have had it. Like Moses. We're not sure. This is not exactly, uh, this is history. But interesting. Um, the Corinthians, and Paul talks about it, that they said he was weak. His speech was not excellent. Now, Paul was a, a brilliant mind. But he resorted not to use his brilliance. He just resorted to use simple Simple words. Something that everybody could understand. Oh, but these false apostles, they love the big words. Oh, makes them sound so smart. And they love to boast about their power. And they could even do miracles. It's, oh, look at the miracles and the signs and the wonders. And Paul didn't come with that. I didn't come with that idea. And they can grip their audience. And they can let people know that they are really in charge. What, that, what did Paul boast about the, in this letter? Or... In any of his letters. What was this boasting about? Christ. Following Christ. Is there any boasted in that? Well, if it means that following Christ means you're persecuted. Uh, it is a boasting, but it's not what the world wants to hear. You, you mean you follow a weak savior that was crucified? Uh, there's no power in that. What else did Paul boast about? Be honest, be honest. Anybody? Christ crucified? Christ resurrected? What about in himself? What did he boast about? His weakness. What else? His chains. Yes, his chains. His body weakness, his chains, his mistakes, right? He boasted about things that we would say, oh, Paul, keep that to yourself. But he says, no, because in the weakness that he was demonstrating, he was honest about it, it was God was demonstrating his power through that weakness. It was God who was coming in and standing with Paul and empowering Paul when it seemed like they were like, how do you boast in your weakness? How do you boast in your chains and your imprisonments and your diseases? And Paul would say, because when I go through that, God uses me more. When I go through that, God uses me more. You want God to use you more? Be weak. That's it. Close your Bibles. Go home. No, but there's more to it, right? Be weak. Weak in a sense of, you know, it's not false humility. It's like, oh, I'm so weak. Lord, help me. You know, I'm just messed up. No, it's a reality. I'm sick, Lord. I can't go on. I don't feel good. Lord, help me. And you will find God coming to your aid. Lord, I have a temper. I have a terrible weakness in my life. I can't go out a day without, you know, losing my top. Lord, help me. And God will bring help to you. And you realize, wow, I am such a weak person. I need God every moment of my life. I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee, says the song. Absolutely true. Because God would demonstrate power in the person's life through a clean conscience. And I, and I mean that, a clean conscience. There's nothing between you and God. And you try to keep your clean conscience with other people. If there's something between you and I, get it straight out. Hopefully. Right? Sometimes it's not up to you only. It's up to them as well. And a clean conscience before God. It says, I have a clean conscience before God. And, you know, you might be upset at me, says Paul. You might be mad at me. But I have a clean conscience. I have confidence. I can boast in this. I boast that I have a clean conscience before God. I've come to glorify God. Let's look at verse 15. Because now Paul is going to talk about another thing that is very important in Christian relationships. What is it? Commitment. That's another big word, right? Integrity and commitment. Two things 
badly needed in the body of Christ. Paul promised to come. Look at verse 15. In this confidence, I intended to come uh, at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. I was going to come and visit you twice. Didn't happen. That is to pass your way into Macedonia. He was going to go up north. And again from Macedonia to come to you. So he had come to help them. Then he was going to come back. He's going to go up to Macedonia. Just north. Helps you if you have a map, right? Where's the map? Uh, there. Up to Macedonia. And then come back to Corinth. And then get back to Judea. Right? Back to Judea. And then start his missionary uh, trip to Spain. That was, that was his intention. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this. Was I? Or what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, so that with me there will be yes and a no, no at the same time. I didn't fool you. I was not this. <laughs> I did not come to you and say, well, I meant to tell you that, yeah, I told you that, but I didn't really mean it. I, um, I'm going to say yes, but it's really a no. Uh, I didn't do this according to the flesh. Paul intended to go. He explains it. I intended to go and visit you so you get a twice a blessing. Right? I was there, went to Macedonia, come back to you, and then head to Judea. But it didn't happen. And Paul is saying, uh, I didn't intend it. I didn't intend that to happen. I actually wanted to come and see you. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not a yes and no person. Right? It's tough to deal with somebody who's a yes and no person. Right? What does he mean today? Is it a yes today or is it a no? Are you going to be here tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, man, that means no, right? Or, um, you know, maybe you can relate to this one. Brother, you going to be here tomorrow? I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. What is that? Now, obviously, it depends on the context of the person. If that person tells you that, right, and it's not a very sure person, it probably means, what do you think? Probably no, right? Uh, but if it's a, someone that's, you know, pretty much a committed person, he was like, oh, he's going to, he, he won't tell me a yes or a no, but he's going to pray about it, right? Or somebody who says, you know what, I'll be here. By God's grace, I'll be here. Uh, and that person, you know, they mean it, right? And here's Paul. He means it. I'll be here. I'm not going to pray about it. I know the Lord wants me here. And I said, but something happened. And we'll know that in chapter 2, so we won't get ahead of ourselves. The commitment that Paul was displaying and it's interesting here because his commitment is, I'm not an unstable person. Paul says, I'm not unstable. You know what an unstable person is? You don't know if they're going to be here or not. You need them. Maybe it's a ministry. Maybe it's an outreach. Maybe it's something. And you tell them, hey, brother, we need you here. Yeah, I'll be there. 1030. Hey, be here today? 11, 12. Well, we're going home. <laughs> oh, man, this happens. You know, it, this happens in a lot of ministries. It happens in a lot of Christians. The commitment level, right? The commitment level, Paul says, I say something, I am going to commit to doing it, right? I am a man of my word, right? And so Paul was supposed to come, and Paul was ready to minister to them. But as soon as he starts talking about, look at brilliantly how Paul brings in God here. He says, my word is true, but you know, I want to tell you someone who is greater than me. Someone whose words are absolutely faithful. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanius, Timothy, was not yes and no, but yes in him. Paul is saying, I'm going to tell you something more faithful than even my own words. The words that we preach to you. What did we preach to you? Jesus. And the words of Jesus are not yes and no. You know, Jesus, you know, meaning he means yes, but he says no. Right? He says he's going to help you, but he really doesn't want to help you. Right? In the Gospels, when you think about Jesus, did Jesus ever say to somebody in need, no, get away from me? Never. Never, ever, ever. If you had a need and you came to Jesus, Jesus always said, yes. Lord, can you come to my house? Let's go. Lord, my servant is sick. Let's go. Lord, can you help me with this? Are you willing? Yes, I am willing, said the Lord. And he healed a man, a blind man. 
They brought him, they brought him the paralytic through the roof. And he healed them. The Lord Jesus never said no to anybody in need. Do you ever know that in the Gospels? He always said yes. Yes, there were the Pharisees who asked him for a sign. And he says, you guys are wicked. You guys are that wicked generation. Or when Herod said, hey, I'm going to bring you and do some miracles before me. And Jesus said nothing to him back. Yes, there were those times where wickedness was before him. But the person in need, Jesus never turned anybody away. Why? Because Jesus' words are trustworthy. If he said yes, he's going to do it. Verse 20. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, also through Christ, or through him, is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. But I call God as witness to my soul that to spare you I did not come again to Corinth. Not that the Lord it over your faith, but are workers with you for joy, for your joy, for your faith, you are standing firm. So we'll finish with this as the last part. Let's look at God's words. Are God's words faithful? Is God's word trustworthy? Well, yes they are. God has immense amount of promises in the Bible. Thousands of promises in the Bible. And here's one key part. When God said something, He will fulfill it. He will underline it, fulfill it, and He will carry it through, through one person, His Son. All the promises of God will be made yes to you in Christ Jesus. That means that apart from Christ... You're not getting God's promises. This idea that you can just believe in God is, I just want God's blessings. They're not coming, brother. There's only one way to get them. Christ Jesus. Well, I believe in God. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is you have to be born again. And then all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. That's who gets the promises. Because all of the promises of God come into reality and fulfillment through this one person. Right? Every one of them, every one of the promises will be fulfilled in Christ. Right? Uh, to us, Christ is the, the, the one who delivers the promises of God. Yes, God says them and he speaks to them and he puts them in on, on, a, on a book, puts them on his word. And he says, look, these are my words. Take them at my word. I said, okay, Lord, how are they going to happen? Look to Jesus. He will carry it through. Lord, are you serious this promise? Yes. What do you need? Well, here's a promise, Lord. Are you going to make it happen in my life? Yes. How are you going to do it, Lord? Get close to Jesus. That's how they're going to come. There is no other way. Right? There is no other way. God has commanded this promise exceedingly great and precious promises, says Peter. And they are amen with certainty. Right? What about our preaching? Well, you know, Paul's talking about preaching here. When he preached to uh, you know, Sylvanius Timothy, you know, our preaching needs to be certain, right? Not him and ha, right? You know what I mean by him and ha? You ask a pastor, Pastor, you believe in the resurrection? Him, ha, well, yes, and no, and you know, you know, modern scholarship says that, well, you know, although people believe the back then, we know it's probably not like that. Oh, forget it. Him and ha, yes and no. Pastor, do you believe in the virgin birth? Well, him, ha, you know. Uh, well, there are people who believe it. <laughs> oh, do you believe it? Oh, pastor, you believe the Bible is infallible, that every word is inspired by God? Well, him, ha, well, it, it, it contains it. Well, I didn't ask if it contains it. I said, is it, is it, is, it is or not? Well... Some people believe it. And then you have modern day Christianity today. Him and ha. Him and ha Christianity. Well, this, yes and no. They don't know what to believe. And the people get affected by it. Well, what does your, your church teach? I don't know. They're always him and hawing about everything. They're always just, they don't know what they believe. So how do they expect them to believe? Most people in the church probably don't even go to a Bible study, right? In, in churches like that. They just go to a show and they just go home. That's all it is. Are they ever going to know? Well, it affects our preaching and needs to be formidable with the truth. 
yes or no. God says this, or God didn't say that. It has to be straight, right? It has to be absolutely clear. How about our prayer life? Does our prayer life get affected by this? Absolutely true. All the promises of God are yes and amen, right? Uh, ask anything in my name, Jesus says, and it'll be done to you. Now, that's not a free ticket to get everything and anything, because you have to ask it in his name, in his authority, in his will, in his purpose. And you have to ask that, you have to think, well, what did God give Jesus? Then what? That's what he's going to give you. I'm not going to treat you any different. He's going to give you what Jesus received. Right? You're not greater than Jesus. He's going to get you, he gave you exactly that. Now, in, in the millennium, he'll give us everything we want. Right? In, in the millennium, we'll have everything we want because we won't have a corrupted flesh and no sin. We will ask for the right things. But until then, it has to be according to his will. But our prayers are, yes, absolutely certain. The word amen, certainly, verily, truly. And it is absolutely, yes, it's going to happen. The promises of God are a reality in Christ Jesus. All of the promises. Now, how many promises? All of them are going to be made a reality in Christ Jesus. Take every promise of the Bible, and they're going to be done in Christ Jesus. Well, let's do an exercise. Want to do an exercise? Doesn't mean stand up and maybe you could do that. Stand up and do that. Let's look at Old Testament promises. Anybody think of an Old Testament promises? Just an Old Testament promise. The virgin birth. It's going to happen that the redemption of Israel in the book of Isaiah was going to come. And it's going to come through a virgin that the deliverer will come from this woman. Who would have no relationship with another man. Right? How did it come about? Jesus was born. Born of a virgin. Conceived by the Holy Spirit. Another promise. Forget all the promise. Did pro God promise to forgive your sins? Yes, Jeremiah 31, 31, right? I will forgive their sins. I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and I will forgive their sins. How is he going to forgive their sins? Get the pattern? Through Jesus. He's going to do it through Jesus. Did God say, did he promise something to Abraham's seed? He did. He promised something to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, your seeds are going to be, great, uh, going to be like the stars in the heavens, like the sand of the sea. You're going to have as many children. You're going to have just an explosion of children. Yes, Abraham had a lot of children. Yes, Abraham had a lot of biological children. But we know in the New Testament, it meant much more than the biological children. Why? Because Paul says that seed was Christ. And all those who are in Christ are children of Abraham by faith. Now the stars are as, you know, now as many as the stars in the, in the, the stars in the sea, stars in the heavens, sands in the sea, right? Why? Because now there's Jew and Gentile together in Jesus. What else did he promise? He promised that he will comfort those who are dying. He will comfort those who are dying. The Bible says that he will be close to those who are suffering, be close to those who are dying. Does God raise the dead? Yeah. How's he going to do that? Jesus. Right? There'll be the voice. The voice of Jesus. John chapter 5, he will say, raise up. And then some will go into everlasting life and some will go to everlasting contempt. Right? Did God say he will judge the world? Yes, through one man, Christ Jesus. God is going to fulfill all his promises for you and for me in Christ Jesus. Now let me ask you something personal. Did God promise something personal to you? Right? Yeah. You don't have to say it if you don't want to. What's that? Strength to the weak. Frank, you receive strength? Amen, right? Yeah. Whatever God has promised to you, even personally, in his word, and he says, this is my word for you, this is what, you, what I have for you, then you trust him in it. How's it going to happen? Get close to Jesus. It won't happen in a vacuum. It'll happen in a personal relationship with Christ. But look at this. Who brought you to Christ? Look what verse 21 says. Now he who established us with you in Christ and anointed us is God. Who brought you to Christ? God. Shocking, isn't it, sometimes? Well, this is the other side of the coin, is it? 
Yeah. Because Jesus said, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws them. You know, the Father really wants you to come to Jesus. You know, the Father's not just a, a, you know, that's an expectator outside of time and going like, well, I hope they come. I hope they come. He's not biting his nails. I hope they come. I hope they come. No, he is wooing you, bringing you, closing you in so that you can come to Christ Jesus. You can't come to Jesus unless the Father draws you. That's a biblical fact without a doubt. Now, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Absolutely. There are two sides of every truth in the Bible. But whoever's drawing you was God. If you thought of Jesus in your life, think about your life before you came to Christ. Think of the times and opportunities people had. And then you attract, you know, maybe you were miserable in your bed. You looked up and you're like, is there any hope? Right? And you thought about Jesus. And you thought about changing. You thought about like, well, maybe I should read my Bible. Or maybe I remember that conversation you had with me. All these things, God was drawing you and drawing you, softening your heart. Why? He wanted you to be in Christ. He also says, he anointed us, established us, right? The word anointed has to do with, of course, the sanctifying part of it. To separate you for himself. Just like the prophets, just like the kings, they were separated for God. For his own work, right? That he anointed them and set them apart. An old man at 80 years old was anointed by God. It was set apart. A young man that was tending sheep was anointed by God. Uh, another man, I'm oh, sorry, a little boy was anointed by God to be a priest. He was brought to the temple, right? Ordinary people. These were not exemplary, amazing people. Just like you, just like me. But God anointed, established them, anointed them, brought them to Jesus. In the Old Testament sense, you would say, but even the New Testament now, it is God who's at work. But he's also doing something more. Verse 22, he also sealed us with and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge, as an earnest. The word seal is like the seal that puts your name on something that belongs to you. It's a seal. So think of a, an ancient marketplace, right? Ancient marketplace, which a lot of them were like in Tarsus. Imagine Paul thinking about this in his life. And, and he goes to the marketplace and there's this whole produce and meats and all kinds of stuff being sold. And he sees, he sees through the marketplace that there's some onions or some vegetables that are set aside. And they have a name on it. And he looks on the other side and there's some other produce and packages that are set aside. And they, there are, they have a seal. That word seal is it had a name, a signet ring or a name attached to that package or that bundle that was being sold. That's called the seal. It belonged to that person. It was, it's theirs, but it's not taken by them yet. It is just simply kept for a time that they will be picked up. So a wealthy man will come in and says, I want 30 pounds of onions or 30,000 eggs or whatever it is and, you know, for, my, for my community. And um, here you go. I will buy them and I will put my seal. They're mine. I can't sell them to anybody else. Well, you could also see that it's also an earnest. It's the word pledge. It's a down payment. So this wealthy man it says, you know, I will give you, and this is what's usually the case, I will give you 20% of the price right now. I will pay a down payment on those produce, on those packages, whatever it is. I will put a down payment on it. I'll put my seal on them. They're mine. He put a pledge. He put an earnest pledge. He made a down payment and he put a seal on it. Now they know they're his. It can't be taken from anybody to anybody else. They're absolutely sold to that person. The payment hasn't been completely paid because it hasn't been completely delivered. Right? So maybe it would be 30 pounds, but maybe that day he took home 10 pounds. And the rest will come later. Right? Once the payment's completely paid or once everything is done, that all the produce and all the onions and everything will be there. It's the same word that Paul uses here. Must have learned it as a young age in those, in those towns, where a person would buy a down payment, will put a seal on those packages, and they were theirs. And Paul says, this is like what God did to us. He put a spirit in us. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. You want to know what eternal life is like? Yes? No? Okay. Uh, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You want to know what communion with God will be like? Pray in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Be led of the Spirit. 
That communion with Christ, that closeness to Christ, right? We have a, a down payment of it. It's just an inkling of it. Oh, it's going to be great. Fellowship is good, sweet, sweet fellowship of the Spirit. Peace, love, joy, kindness, goodness, right? The fruit of the Spirit, the character of Christ being built in you, it's eternal life. You already know what it's like, but only a down payment. The rest is coming. He's put a seal in you. So I've got all these promises, and you say, Pastor, what happens to people then? I mean, the people that, 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 that they have a breakdown in this. The, the issue is not on the Lord's side. The issue is on their side. If the relationship breaks down, it's on our side, not God's side. He's promised these things. He can't go back on it. He can't go back. If a person is in Christ, he's a new creation. That's a promise from God. That is true. Now, if there's a breakdown in that relationship, it's not on God's side. He didn't say, hey, you're, I'm done with you. People may say that about God. I'm done with you. But he won't say that about you. Because he's faithful. He's true. He's right. And Corinthians, you guys have got it all wrong. You guys have been saying things about me, Paul is saying. You've been saying things about my behavior. You've been saying things about all this stuff that I've done and written. Which one is better, as Paul is saying? You know, he introduces God into this conversation. He's, he's relating to how they're talking about him in a bad way. And then he brings God in. He says, you know who's faithful? God. You know what we should be talking about? We should be talking about the faithfulness of God. Not what you think my unfaithfulness is. Because God's word is faithful. What do you think is better? Talking about man's words? What these apostles are saying? These false apostles? Or what God says and what God's word is, Right? And everybody needs to be convinced of the great truth of the gospel. We need to realize how small, how meaningless it is to have such conversations of backbiting and criticizing other believers. I'm talking about in a fellowship setting, right? Uh, of attacking other believers for misunderstandings, things that never happened or things that maybe did happen. They need to get straightened out. It is much better, much better to talk about the truth of God. Oh, it's so much better. In fact, a heart that doesn't talk about the truth of God, a heart that doesn't want to talk about the truth of God, but rather wants to talk about the things of men in conversations about things that are meaningless in terms of backbiting and arguing and complaining and attacking others. What? It's a person whose heart is not convinced of the truth of the gospel. Or at that point, they haven't realized how much worthy it is to talk about the gospel and what God has done in your life, right? And all this stuff is a sign that people are not captured by the truth of the gospel. A church that has begun to backbite each other and tear each other up, they have forgotten it. They have forgotten the truth of the gospel. They have forgotten and realized that it's not worth it. Absolutely not. It is much better to talk about the things of God than the things of men. You ever notice that? But notice here, we final, final part. He says, the word of God and the spirit of God. This is what we label or we titled it today, the word and the spirit. Why? Well, whenever you have the word of God, you have the spirit of God. And Paul's made it clear. The promises of God are yes and amen. And what's going to make it happen is the spirit of God. God is bringing us through Jesus, but it's the Holy Spirit who's bringing that reality in our lives, right? Paul's companion preached the word, but those words that they preach, that they preach, would be meaningless unless the Holy Spirit was taking that word and bringing it into people's hearts and convicting them and bringing the reality of that scripture into people's hearts, right? How did the uh, Corinthians in, enter into that enjoyment of God's word? Is because... They were in Christ, and the Holy Spirit was making it real. How did they come to Christ? Well, they, they heard the gospel. God drew them to the gospel, and they made a decision. But the Holy Spirit is involved in the whole thing. He inspired the word, and he's convicting people to the word. And guess what you have now? You have a soul that's been converted. You have somebody born of the Spirit. You have some, somebody who's walking in the Spirit, right? And so this is what Christians are to be, the word and the Spirit. You need both. And whenever there's conflicts with Christians, you need sincerity, you need commitment. Next week we'll talk about Paul's openness, but we need the word and the spirit, right? We need this to get through it. 
God's word and the proclamation of Christ needs to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in people's lives. And so as you deal with others, and Paul had a lot to deal with. You're talking about a church that was against him. He needed the word and the spirit. And that's what he brings in both. He says, before I tell you what happened to me, I need to tell you how God is faithful, how his words are unchanging. His promises are absolutely true. You can count on them. Get a hold of his promises. Truly, get a hold of his promise and ask God, Lord, would you do this in my life? Would you make me like Jesus? Would you make me, and if you've never been born again, would you make me a new creation? Would you draw me to Jesus? Would you make me and help me believe the truth? Would you help me not to be deceived, Lord? Would you help me see through things that I may not see and discern things I may not understand? And the Holy Spirit will come right to your aid. Says, glad you ask. Here's the help. And you'll see him strengthening your life in areas where you were completely weak. I can't believe I did that. Well, it was God who was drawing you. He established you. He anointed you. He sealed you. He empowered you. He put a down payment in your life. It's called the Holy Spirit. And now he's going to work in you for his good pleasure. Isn't that wonderful? How did Paul flip this? Right? That's a crazy thing. How did Paul flip this from attack, attack, attack to like, you know what? I'm going to tell you about God's word. I'm going to tell you how faithful he is to you, Corinthians. You guys are spoiled brats. But God's going to do a work in you. He established you. He anointed you. He's going to take care of you. You just need to trust him. And then we're going to talk about the faithful God is to you and how you can count on him. I mean, you imagine the Corinthians going, we've been really bad toward Paul. <laughs> and this is kind of convicting because you're like, we've been fighting with Paul and he's encouraging us to follow Jesus. You ever done that with someone? I'm not saying to be mean. Maybe it's your wife or your husband. I don't know. Or somebody else. And they're just being mean, just like trying to provoke a fight. And he says, you know what? You know what God's going to do in your life? He loves you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to put God's word in your life, his spirit in you. And you're going to walk with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? You're going to have eternal life in him. That person's going to be going like, how do I fight with this person? How do I argue with something that is so true? And something that maybe you really want. That, my friend, is encouragement. That, my friend, is what it's needed to bring Christians back together, to remind them, look how God is faithful to you even if your snotty attitude. Look how good he is to you even with your spoiled brat attitude. He is going to do a work in you. It's a promise. How do you know? He promised it. He cannot lie. And he's already given you something. Or someone, I should say. The Holy Spirit to make it true in your life. All you need to do is walk in the Spirit, obey the Word of God, and He will empower you to do it. Well, I forgot what the argument was about. <laughs> I even forgot what the fight was about. That person really loves me. That's probably what the Corinthians felt. We've been fighting with Paul. He really cares for us. He really cares for our eternal life. And if you know somebody that cares for your eternal life, you got a good friend. You have a really, really, really good friend. And uh, why don't you be that good friend? Why don't you really care for people's eternal life? And instead of fighting with them, tell them how God is faithful. Instead of arguing with them about the dishes or the socks or whatever it is, or the fighting or the babies or the this, tell them how God is so good to them that he's going to fulfill all the promises. And then start reading the promises. Which one? Oh, I'm glad you asked. And just start reading the Bible together. That solves a lot of marriage problems. A lot of counseling has gone out the window just by those very simple things. Let's pray. Lord, it's difficult to see churches fighting, attacking other believers like Paul. Um, Lord, it's difficult to see how even among the congregation there'll be divisions, there'll be fights, there'll be misunderstanding and and yet, it goes on. Sometimes it fuels the fire by others who have worse intentions. Lord, we don't doubt Satan is in the middle of all that. We don't doubt that there is false apostles and believers who want to create more doubt and more confusion. 
But Lord, we thank you that your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. That you will forgive our sins. That you will take our sins as far as the east is from the west. That you will forget them and that you will... Close the fire Whoa. by others who have worse intentions. Lord, we don't doubt Satan is in the middle of all that. It's hard to see my... Hear yourself speak. Lord, thank you that you have great kindness toward us. And we pray, Lord God, for relationships within our fellowship, whether they be marital relationships or friends or family, or loved ones, whatever it may be, Lord, that they would be brought forth to you in sincerity and commitment. And they will be able to love each other through your word and by the spirit. Lord, it's so needed. We don't want Satan to grab a hold of any relationship and destroy it. We want people to be in love with you and in love with one another. Thank you, Lord, that you have made it all possible. You who brought us to Jesus. Oh, God, we owe you everything. You brought us to Jesus. Even while we were yet sinners, you sent your son and you put him on a cross for us. He died for us. And thank you, Lord, that it wasn't all that you did. You sent your spirit and you put him in us. A down payment, a pledge, a seal. So that we will be your people. Committed to you wholeheartedly. Lord, so much you've done for us. I can, words at this point, cheapen it. Because it's so great. Help us, Lord, to understand your great and precious promises your great and mighty things that you will do in us and help us, Lord, to be excited because it is your word and your spirit working in our hearts for your good pleasure to do your will, O oh Lord. Lord, may our hearts be willing to glorify you, to be sincere and to be committed to the service of you and to the service of your people. For in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.